Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our grand rounds today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lee. So uh, Dr. Lee is an associate professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology and the inaugural Parker Hannafin Helen Moss Re Cancer Research Foundation Professor of Integrative Oncology. He serves as the Director of Supportive and Integrative Oncology at the University Hospital Simon Cancer Center and as Director of the Case Center of for Integrative Oncology. Dr. Lee started his career at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. Uh, he is a graduate of George Washington University and completed his internal medicine residency at Stanford, which was followed by a Fulbright scholarship in traditional Chinese medicine with a focus on acupuncture at China Medical University in Taiwan. He then completed fellowships in hematology and medical oncology at the University of Chicago, where he was a chief fellow, and he also received formal specialized training in clinical medical ethics. He subsequently completed a fellowship in palliative medicine at Northwestern University. Dr. Lee is board certified in internal medicine, hematology, medical oncology, hospice, and palliative care. His research is focused on integrative oncology interventions, uh, such as natural products and acupuncture, to treat cancer and its associated symptoms, and has included explorations of physician knowledge and attitudes, as well as patterns of health care delivery. So please welcome him to our grand rounds today. Hey, good afternoon. Um, thank you for that introduction and inviting me here today to uh, talk about uh, one of my two hats that I wear here. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm using the lapel mic. Uh, just hearing that, my uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this last time, but when I was finishing fellowship in Chicago, and I told my uh, Pimonk uh, fellowship director, I said, well, I'm going to do one more fellowship in palliative medicine. And she's like, Rich, you just got to get a job. Just stop <laughs> training, get a job. So I took her advice. That was my last fellowship. Uh, and then uh, I've been <laughs> working uh, ever since. So uh, as you heard, I also uh, spent some time in Asia learning about traditional Chinese medicine. I think last time I spoke here about supportive and integrative oncology. And so today I'm going to be really focusing on my other hat, which is as a traditional medical oncologist. I focus on GI medical oncology. And uh, my kind of research uh, interest is really looking at liver cancer, both uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. So we'll be talking about that today and some of the uh, translational research uh, programs and uh, activities that we're doing. So uh, kind of going through the background about HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma, how do we uh, evaluate and stage it, and then think about the different treatment options, which really has evolved over the past couple of years. Uh, we're seeing, as a medical oncologist, um, 10 years ago we had very few options, and now we actually have uh, several options to look at and more coming in through the pipeline. Uh, and then lastly, talking about uh, some research that we're doing. So I'm just going to start with a case, uh, it's something you probably will see in your training here uh, if you haven't already. So um, a very common example, you have a gentleman coming in in his 60s, he's recently diagnosed uh, hepatitis C-related cirrhosis, and of course as part of his workup is PCP, he's checking some blood work, notices some abnormal liver function tests, and does some imaging. And I have some different scenarios here, ranging from a, a very small half centimeter lesion to a very involved lesion with uh, lymph nodes, and how do we approach these patients? So if you think about HCC as a whole, um, it's actually one of the uh, most common uh, cancers in the world. So the sixth most common worldwide and the second leading cause of death uh, from cancer in the world. In the United States, it's not as common. So it's not really in the top 10 um, in terms of uh, prevalence, but in terms of causes of death, it is uh, the fifth most common, eighth most common in uh, men and women. And recently, we've been seeing in developed countries actually a rise in the incidence of HCC Part of this is thought to be at least related to hepatitis C, but also I think there's an increasing incidence of non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease, and that may be also causing an increase, especially in the coming years. So we'll see how the trend goes. But I should say in uh, Asian countries where it's most prevalent, right, so hepatitis B related, um, countries like Taiwan, which have a national healthcare system, have done a great job in terms of vaccination. So you're seeing their rates go down um, in some areas. So. So think about risk factors. I think some of us are familiar uh, with the risk factors. We talked about uh, viral etiologies, hepatitis B, which is a, a DNA virus versus hepatitis C and RNA, uh, as well as other toxins, so things that we come across fairly frequently, uh, fair, fairly frequently. And then in the United States, really, we're looking at hepatitis C as the major cause, um, although we have a lot of patients from other countries, so hepatitis B, alcohol, uh, and then we see some uh, congenital hemochromatosis, autoimmune, primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, and, of course, um, other causes. Uh, we talked about the um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and toxins as well. So 
uh, it's important to keep those in mind if we see our younger patients. So what is the differential diagnosis of a liver lesion? So not everything in the liver is necessarily cancer. Of course, uh, that's something I'm focused on. So, of course, it could be HCC. Some of the markers we generally look for are HEPAR1. And um, we'll talk about some of the classic radiological uh, signs of HCC. Um, could be cholangiocarcinoma, another, um, the other major liver-derived cancer. Uh, and, of course, then we have um, something where it's actually in between. We just had a case the other day in tumor board where you can have a cancer that has both features of cholangio and HCC. Generally, we treat this more like a cholangiocarcinoma than we do as an HCC, but it's important to realize you can have both. Um, metastasis, of course, so it doesn't have to be coming from the liver. And then um, some other maybe not as uh, worrisome things like focal nodular hyperplasia. It tends to have a central scar. Um, actually, you can do EOVIST uh, dye with CT scan data to help delineate what type, uh, if it is FNH or not. Hemangiomas, so again, commonly seen and benign uh, generally. So you can have flash material enhancement, usually in the periphery, and then slowly the dye, the contrast will fill in centrally and has no washout. Um, adenomas, and of course, you can have abscesses. So uh, we commonly see patients who come into the um, hospital, have sepsis, and then they actually show up with some liver lesions but generally sometimes not really cancer. It's more infection, and it will resolve after antibiotics. So it's important to think about there are some subtypes of HCC. So radiographically, um, most commonly we see nodular. So you see these defined nodules, but you can have patients who have just a single, very large, massive lesion. And then HCC can also be diffuse. So you don't really necessarily see clear borders, but it's, you see abnormalities involving a segment of the liver because you know, it's just diffusely involving in the tissue. Um, the WHO has different uh, classifications. Um, the most common we see is the hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, Fibrolamellar is a, a rare subtype. Um, most of these other subtypes are really make up less than 5%. Um, but fibrolamellar is commonly seen in younger patients. So if you have a 20-year-old who comes in with a large liver lesion that appears to be cancerous, you have to think about fibrolamellar. Um, and then we talked about mixed HCC. And then you have these other uh, very rare subtypes like um, clear cell, trabecular, um, cirrhosis and spindle uh, forms. Again, very rare, less than 5%. So generally, we won't, we won't see these subtypes. Now, um, HCC is one of the few cancers that actually does not require a needle biopsy. So many of our patients, probably up to half or more, actually do not have a tissue diagnosis. So usually you get an on-consult, and there's no diagnosis. We always say tissue is the issue. Please get a biopsy. Uh, but for HCC, actually, you don't have to. Um, so what's really required, you have to have a what we call liver protocol, either CT or MRI. You really need to have three phases, early arterial, late, and then a portal venous phase um, to be able to properly diagnose without a biopsy. Um, so you then generally will see two classical um, features, which is a hyper, uh, hyper enhancement in the early arterial phase and then washout. We'll, I'll show you some images. You can also have a capsule, and it tends to be hyper intense on a a T1-weighted uh, T1 uh, MRI imaging. Um, now, this only includes patients who have known cirrhosis. So if you have a, a healthy young patient who does not have cirrhosis, you cannot uh, diagnose it by imaging alone. You should get a biopsy for this patient. So that's the caveat. So if you have a patient who does not have known cirrhosis, you should be getting a tissue biopsy for these patients. Okay. So um, there's something called the LIRAD system. You may not have heard about it, but it's something we're using more and more the last couple of years. Essentially, it's a system where we look at the different features and we give them a rating one through five. One is most, you know, almost definitively benign, and five being almost definitively HCC, and everything in between from two, three, four, and five. So really, when you think about um, does it have the hyper-enhancement, and does it have at least one of these other features, washout, capsule, or here threshold growth is more than 50% growth in six months. Um, the other thing you have to think about the size. So if it's less than one centimeter, it can never reach a LIRADS-5. It has to be at least one centimeter in diameter before we can uh, consider it LIRADS-5. But LIRADS-5 has a, a, a specificity of over 90%. Uh, we did have one case, I think, where it was a LIRADS-5, and then the tissue diagnosis actually came out not to be HCC, but it's pretty rare. So um, once, if you have a LIRADS-5 lesion, you're pretty definitive, and it's adequate for diagnosis of HCC. All right. um, so let's go uh, back to one of our cases here. So you have the same gentleman, and you do, um, you do some workup, and it shows a half-centimeter lesion. He has known cirrhosis. So what would be the next step in, in management? Any, any thoughts here to the health staff? Just yell it out. I know you're having lunch. What do you think? Should we... Uh, Monitor, should we call surgery, Ken? I see Ken Shaven in the back. Do we need to call Ken urgently? 
we need to do a resection. So it would be very reasonable to do an MRI to further characterize, and you might just monitor. So many of these lesions, especially if they're sub-centimeter, may not require an intervention. Okay, so if you have a single lesion, sub-centimeter, um, remember that patients with cirrhosis should be getting ultrasounds every six months, okay, as part of their monitoring um, surveillance schedule. All right, so here's some of the uh, radiographic features we're talking about. So here in the first box, you're looking at um, basically non-contrast, so you've seen a hypointense lesion, and then early on, and this is why it's important, you'll see early enhancement uh, with the early arterial phase, and then you start to see a capsule, and the port of venous phase, you're seeing it wash out. So when you say wash out, you really, it's, you still really don't see a signal there at all compared to the normal parenchyma. And then you see some uh, um, diffusion-weighted um, hyperintensity here. Okay, so this is very classic for HCC. In this kind of patient with cirrhosis, you would not need a biopsy. Okay, now the, um, when you think about the staging system, there is the AJCC, which is the classical staging system we, we use for most cancers. Uh, I think the important thing here um, you can see that we're looking at tumor size, so is it a single tumor or multiple tumors? Is it greater or less than five centimeters? Is it involving any major um, vasculature? And the other thing to note is that any lymph node involvement is automatically considered stage four, okay? So this is not true for most other cancer types where lymph node involvement often denotes uh, stage three, but in liver cancer, because of the nature and biology of it, any lymph node involvement is automatic stage four, so advanced disease. Right, so some things to keep in mind. Um, the reality is I don't use this, and, and practically most of us don't use the staging system um, very often. Oops, let me see here. So uh, another thing, to, um, another staging system that many of us use, and this is more practical, is that we use the Barcelona Clinic, uh, uh, Barcelona Liver, uh, Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Staging System, B BCLC, <laughs> is what we call it. So. <laughs> Here's a more practical staging system developed by the Europeans. And so what we're really looking at is a couple features is the size, the less than two centimeters, CP is child P score, and we're going to go over that, and their performance status. So patients early on, um, these patients are still very, we, we, we consider curable. Intermediate stage, we can think about local regional therapies, and we'll talk more about that. And then advanced stage, where we're looking, really thinking about systemic therapies. And of course, for very advanced patients who have poor performance status, really thinking about palliative care as a goals or hospice for these patients. Um, now, this is a, a recent paper that came out looking at untreated patients in these different stages. What is the life expectancy? So you can see untreated, these kind of patients, you don't do anything. They're going to still live about a year. Um, intermediate stage, about nine to ten months. But advanced stages without treatment is really a short overall prognosis for these patients. So the child P score, I know all of you uh, know this by heart. Um, so uh, for those who might have forgotten, uh, the five things that we're going to look for specifically is albumin, bilirubin, INR, do they have a history of ascites, and they have a history of encephalopathy. And so based on this uh, scoring system, we can give them a child Pew score ranging from 5 to 15. Child Pew A is 5 to 6. They still have fairly good liver function. Um, you can see their one to two year survival here is still quite good. Uh, and they have some functional compromise, a score of 7 to 9, so child Pew B and then child Pew C, 10 to 15, with a much lower overall survival because of just from alone from their poor liver function, not even, you know, this is a survival for patients who don't even have cancer. This is just patients who have cirrhosis, okay? Um, and then the other important score that's uh, utilized is called the MELD uh, score, Model for End-Stage Liver Disease. This is the score, main score that's used for liver transplant evaluation and by hepatologists. So this is uh, incorporating the creatinine, bilirubin, and INR. It goes from a score of 6 to 40. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, so uh, the child P you can kind of calculate in your head. Uh, as you can see, you're probably going to need your calculator unless you're a, a math uh, PhD uh, to calculate the MELD score. Um, but key things here is that once you can see that the drop-off starts really occurring around 20, um, and you can see the less than 20, they're still doing pretty well, and you can see this is their three-month survival. So uh, once they hit in the 30s, uh, their three-month survival is getting to 50% or less. So uh, pretty sick patients. So an important, another important scoring system to keep in mind. So here has been the schematic that we've used for many years uh, for HCC. Um, this is um, taken from a, a review article uh, from some of the uh, key leaders in <coughs> HCC. Uh, and you can see for patients of very early stage uh, to early stage, they can still be uh, curative. And so thinking about either ablation, resection, and we're going to talk about these in more detail, transplantation, uh, for patients who are intermediate, 
is to really we consider this uh, local regional therapies with arterial directed therapies. But really we've evolved over the past few years, so there are several local regional therapies we can consider now. And then for advanced patients with BCLC stage C, serafin used to be the only uh, treatment, but until last year we now actually have several. So now we have uh, at least three systemic therapies we can thinking about. And then for uh, BCLC stage D, really thinking about palliative and hospice uh, options for them. So let's talk about the definitive treatment. So uh, when you think about the overall five-year survival for patients, it's actually not very good, uh, in part because many of these patients are caught late. So uh, when we actually identify the cancer, it's already started spreading either too large um, or it's very pretty advanced. So, uh, but if we are able to get definitive treatment, uh, five-year survival is fairly reasonable, uh, looking at over 50%, and we're going to talk about some of these different approaches. So here's just a, um, a, a graph, a table looking at surgery versus RFA for a fairly limited stage disease. So uh, as you can see here, the overall survival for these patients is quite good if we can get them either to surgery or RFA. Most of these lesions are less than three to five centimeters in these studies. So really these options are very good for what we would consider very early or less than two centimeters generally. All right. um, and so when you think about ablation, there are actually different techniques, radio frequency and microwave technology. We have a very good uh, IR department here, John Davidson, Dan Patel, and others, Nami Azar. Um, and so when it's less than two centimeters, really we say less than three centimeters, we feel safe that ablation is a reasonable option for these patients, especially for those that have a lot of comorbidity, so aren't able to have a major surgery. All right. Um, and so for a patient here, for this example, we're seeing that his lesion is a little bit larger. It's now 1.8 centimeters. What would we consider for this patient? I think it'd be reasonable to consider both surgery or ablation. A lot of it depends on their comorbidities and location of the lesion. So evaluation both by radiology and surgery uh, would be uh, a good option here. Now let's talk about liver transplantation. So uh, we have an active liver transplant uh, program here led by uh, Ken Shaven, who's in the back. Um, over 17,000 patients are on the waiting list, uh, about 6,000 liver transplants a year. Um, and the survival is quite good, as you can see here, um, we're looking at fiber survival rate of over 70%. Uh, really, I think the data looks like it's probably in the range of 70 to 80% long-term survival for these patients. Um, so a, compared to patients who don't get liver transplant, it can be quite uh, poor. So really, when you're thinking about these patients, transplantation offers the best long-term outcome if we can get them to transplant. Now, of course, transplant is a complicated uh, procedure, and it requires, you know, is the patient still drinking? Hopefully they're reliable. Do they have the right support system? So they're evaluated by the whole transplant team. Um, this is really the landmark paper, uh, what established the Milan criteria for liver transplant for these patients, uh, showing that very, very good long-term outcome. So the key here is to remember the Milan criteria, uh, followed by most institutions, including ourselves, where you want a single lesion less than five centimeters or three lesions all less than three centimeters. You, you cannot have any extrahepatic disease or major mas macrovascular involvement uh, in these patients. Um, some groups have tried to extend the criteria, so we call it the UCSF criteria, single lesion less than 6.5 centimeters, or three lesions, each less than 4.5 centimeters, or total diameter of eight, uh, less than 8 centimeters. So um, something to think about for these patients, and if you're not sure, you should refer them to our transplant program. Um, we have a really good team here. So for this patient, um, he has several lesions, and now you're seeing uh, more lesions, 1.8, 2.3, and 4.3 centimeters, so what's the next Step in management, what do you think we should do? We just talked about the Milan criteria. So does the patient meet the Milan criteria? No. But that doesn't mean they're not able to get a transplant. So for a lot of these patients, especially if they're just a little bit beyond, so it should be three, three lesions all less than three centimeters. But can you downstage this lesion? So can we do local regional therapy either with TACE or Y90, get that lesion less than three centimeters and still can continue with the transplant evaluation? So. Um, don't always, you know, just because they don't meet criteria doesn't mean they still can't get a transplant. If they're just beyond criteria, make sure they see transplant and then think about downstaging these patients. So what about local regional uh, therapies? So there are actually several local regional therapies. Uh, we talked about ablation, you know, radio frequency or microwave. And then we have several what we call directed arterial uh, therapies. Uh, transarterial embolization, you can do chemoembolization and drug eluting <laughs> transarterial embolization. And then there's newer therapies like what we call Y90. Um, we're using radioactive beads and uh, serotactic body radiation. So um, when we're thinking about embolization here, you can see that um, the blood flow to HCC tends to be more arterial, so that makes them eligible for these types of approaches. And if you embolize and stop the blood flow, we can actually get disease control for these patients. So 
who's eligible? So they have to have a good performance status. Um, they have to have reasonable uh, function, liver function. So generally we say if they're a child PUB7, uh, that's probably okay. But once you start to get a child PUB8 or 9, you really have to think very carefully. Um, and a relative contraindication is a, pulmonary, a portal vena, venous thrombosis. Okay. So, um, but it's not an absolute. And there are some other therapies we can consider. Um, most common uh, side effects can be uh, post-embolization syndrome. So it can have pain and fever, usually in the 24 to 48 hours, but usually it resolves, so it's not a major issue. Um, but we have to think very carefully, do they have enough reserve function? Because we can cause further hepatic dysfunction. And in some cases, if we don't choose carefully, can we also send them into further liver failure after the procedure? And then you can have you know, things like abscess and, and GI bleeding uh, from these procedures. Now, there have been multiple, multiple studies comparing just what we call bland embolization versus chemoembolization. Um, I would say there's a lot of debate whether one is better than the other. Some studies show yes, some studies show no, and then they've compared chemoembolization to drug eluding beads <laughs> embolization. Again, I would say, um, you know, we generally use depth-taste drug eluding bead um, uh, transarterial chemoembolization. There is some data that you probably need less repeat procedures with that, um, but uh, and so that's another important point. They can get multiple procedures to get that liver lesion under control. But it does appear that drug eluding probably decreases the number for repeat procedures, uh, and it's fairly well tolerated. Now, the other thing that we're often using now as well is thinking about radioembolization. So this is using a ipium 90, uh, 90 bead, and you have these spheres that can be injected. Um, you can see most of the radiation is delivered um, within the first two weeks uh, and can be quite helpful as well. Uh, some of the advantages here is that if they have the um, either vasculature involvement, thrombosis, mm -hmm. Y90 is still a good option versus it may be riskier with procedures like TACE. So, of course, they have compared TACE and, and, and radioembolization. Uh, and I think the key thing here is that the outcomes look fairly, uh, fairly similar. So I think it's really about thinking about the characteristics of the size, location of the lesion, which procedure might be optimal, uh, so worth evaluating. And then more recently, groups have started using stereotactic body radiation, so very, very intense high-dose radiation to these lesions and showing some fairly good results. This is uh, on the left side here, tumors less than 2 centimeters compared to ablation versus tumors greater than 2 centimeters. So, uh, and uh, Jenny Doris, who works with us, is uh, very happy to see patients. So when we think about these local regional therapies, it can range from ablation if it's less than 2 to 3 centimeters. Sometimes we're using combination uh, chemoembolization with ablation for 3 to 5 centimeter lesions. If it's greater than five centimeters, you really want to think about the characteristics. How many lesions are there? Is there vascular involvement? Then why 90? Radioembolization might be reasonable. Or is a single lesion with vascular involvement, you might think about SBRT for these patients. So a lot of good options for these patients that have evolved over the past uh, several years now. Um, I think uh, the other key thing is it really takes a multidisciplinary approach. So we have a tumor board where everyone's available and really can talk about the risks and benefits of each approach. So for this patient, um, we're seeing He's got three lesions, all fairly large, all on the right side with some right portal vein involvement. Um, here, you could think about both, as we just talked about, radioembolization as well as SBRT. So both would be reasonable options to think about uh, and worth sending to radiology and uh, our colleagues in radiation oncology. So then let's kind of transition now to um, what about patients with, uh, oh, cost. This is a little break here in the data. So he says, um, it costs about $10,000 a month with survival of 6 to 12 months. Um, how long will it survive if I don't take it 6 to 12 months? So th this used to be true, actually, for uh, systemic therapy. So 10 years ago, we really had no systemic therapy that showed survival benefit. But luckily, uh, new things have been developed since then. So uh, this is just some general costs if you think about the different options we were just talking about. And there is a wide range of costs from less than $1,000 to up to $20,000 for some of these therapies. So I think you have to think about being cost effective as well. Uh, with the current healthcare environment. So uh, before 2008, there was really no good uh, agent that we had for advanced cancer patients. Uh, they may have shrank the cancer, but they didn't really show survival benefit. Uh, even when I was training, I remember my colleague was saying, well, maybe we use adriamycin, but we're not even sure it helps that much. You know, this is back in like 2007, 2008. But soon after, uh, serafinib was um, actually FDA approved, and last year we had two approvals. So let's talk about some of these uh, therapies that can be utilized. Um, 
So the uh, serafina was approved on two major phase three studies, the SHARP study, which was primarily in uh, the U.S. and Europe, and then the Asia-Pacific study, so uh, in Asia. And what we saw is that with serafina, we actually saw a, a, a real survival benefit, you know, looking at about two and a half, three months uh, in the SHARP study, and in Asia, uh, about two months. It, this really goes to the disease biology. So here in the U.S. and Europe, we're really looking at hepatitis C and alcohol versus in Asia, it's really hep B related. So you can see in, it's been shown that patients with advanced disease, hep B patients seem to do worse. Um, and then so serafin is an oral medication taken twice a day. Um, it doesn't really shrink the cancer. So if you look at partial or complete response, you're only looking in the 2% range. But it does help stabilize disease, uh, although the cancer itself is, can, tends to be slow growing. Um, but we did show a survival benefit. So this has really kind of made a big change. And you can see it targets a lot of different tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, our tyrosine kinase uh, proteins. Um, it also probably indicates either it's kind of a, what we call a dirty drug or we, we probably don't really understand what it exactly targets. So, um, And then some of the common side effects range from diarrhea to hand foot syndrome. Um, liver dysfunction is common, so you have to dose it very carefully. Now, we've also compared, well, what if we look at Y90 versus serafin for these patients? So this, these are two papers that just came out very recently in the past year. And what we're seeing is that... Um, Y90 for advanced patients versus serafinib, there is not uh, any major statistically significant difference, although they both favored serafinib uh, in both of these randomized trials. So <clears throat> in both the Sarah study and Servinib study, you can see the, it's very consistent. Serafinib got to about 10 months, and then Y90 is about 8 to 9 months. Um, so I think we have to choose these uh, patients very carefully. I think patients who have um, you know, uh, one-sided disease, that might be a better patient for Y90 versus patients who have bilateral multifocal disease or extrahepatic disease. Really, we need to be thinking about systemic therapy rather than local regional therapy for these patients. Um, and then um, just last year, regorafenib, another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, was approved uh, based on this study from Resource. Now, what's interesting is that you can see it was uh, 7.8 versus 10.6 months for uh, regorafenib. You might say, well, that, that looks almost the same as the serafinib study. Um, and all these patients in this study were serafinib failures. Okay, so they had already progressed on serafinib, then tried regorafinib. And you can say, well, if the serafinib was 7 point, I think it was like 7.9 and 10.7, how could you have almost the exact same result for a second line TKI? <clears throat> so I think it really goes to the biology. So patients who are well enough, who probably respond to serafinib, then progress later on, they're responds to another TKI. <clears throat> so that's how they're able to get another 10-month second-line therapy. So uh, patients in my practice, if I see a patient do well in serafinib, maybe stay for a year, year and a half, um, I actually think about regorafinib because it tells me their biology seems to, uh, to respond to these types of agents. Now, luckily, what do you do for those patients who didn't respond to serafinib first line? So, um, oh, actually, so regorafinib, um, before we go on that, you can see another, <laughs> if you look it up on Lexicon, it has like, different targets. Again, we probably don't really know exactly what it's targeting. Um, but one key thing here is that you're seeing objective response rates in the 11%. Remember, serafin of objective response is like 2%. Um, so you're actually getting more objective responses in these patients, and you get uh, about 50% having stable disease. So we're actually slow down, we're able to slow down the cancer, and in some patients actually shrink the cancer. So what do we do for those patients who tried serafin or regorafin? We actually have nivolumab now. So you probably heard about PD-1 inhibitors or checkpoint inhibitors. It was just approved for HCC. So these are all patients who failed serafinib frontline and then went on to nivolumab. And what we're actually seeing is now we talked about a 10% or 11% response rate. Now you're getting to 20% of patients who actually have shrinkage of their cancer with another 45% stable disease. And you're seeing a median response rate of almost 10 months. So we're actually making a lot of progress here for these patients. So second line, we're already seeing pretty good uh, disease control rates. Um, and has a lot less side effects in general, but they can still have serious side effects and require hospitalization. So something to keep in mind with nivolumab. Um, so, and there's a lot of um, new therapies coming down the line. So for this patient who has multiple lesions bilaterally, already has lymph node involvement, so that would be a stage four, um, these patients should really be thinking about systemic therapy with either serafinib frontline, which is the only one approved right now, or a clinical trial. Now, um, and when we think about the genetics, how do we target HDC? Uh, these are the most common uh, genetic mutations we're finding in HDC, ranging from um, telomere stability and uh, Wnt pathway, chromatin remodeling, 
um, are really those in the top half are the ones you see more frequently and you have more rare uh, mutations. There are WINT uh, pathway inhibitors uh, out there that people are checking as well. So um, when we think about cancer treatment as a whole, early, you know, high-risk patients with cirrhosis, we have to think about surveillance, early stage, think about either surgery, ablation, or transplantation, the best long-term outcome. Intermediate stages, we're thinking about local regional therapies. And for advanced stages, now we have multiple options versus 10 years ago, we really didn't have any great options for these patients or a clinical trial, right? So we have to advance the field. So there have been recent uh, publications using other TKIs, levantinib and cabozantinib. Cabozantinib was more uh, targeting MET is what we believe, showing some small survival benefit. Levantinib was really um, equivalent to serafinib, although they have not been FDA approved. So we'll see. I think a lot of the companies are waiting for the other studies looking at PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab. So there's studies looking at nivolumab first line, using it as adjuvant therapy. Pembrolizumab, another uh, PD-1 inhibitor for second line. And we have uh, studies looking at serafinib together with radiation or Y90. So I think there's going to be more and more options in the next uh, few years. So with the last uh, 20 minutes or so, what I'd like to focus on is what uh, what's happening here at Simon Cancer Center thinking about treatment uh, for HCC. So uh, we have a phase one, two study um, looking at TRC-105, which is a anti-indiglin or anti-CD-105, so it's another uh, VEGF anti-angiogenic therapy, combining it with serafinib, showing some early responses. Uh, we also have a SWOG trial that Jenny Dorth is the PI of, looking at serafinib with radiation versus uh, serafinib alone, as we were talking about. And then we're looking at some basic and translational research uh, approaches. So uh, we have an ongoing protocol we're actually collecting uh, from the OR uh, both normal and HCC tissue and trying to grow them in the laboratory uh, patient-derived xenograft PDX models so that we can improve uh, our laboratory um, models of HCC. Uh, we also um, have colleagues in radiology who are looking at imaging models to see if they might predict response. So uh, Norbert Avril and Zhong Hong Lee are looking at patients who are going on regorafenib or PD-1 inhibitors to see if their imaging studies might predict response. And I'm going to be talking about... Um, some things we're looking at the laboratory, both uh, natural products, which is an area of interest for mine, um, and specifically I'm going to talk about mistletoe lectins in the last 20 minutes here. So um, now before, do we have any questions about kind of treatment before we go into the... Mm -hmm. So it's not required for diagnosis, but I think it clinically can be helpful. The reason if you look at the guidelines, we don't use it for diagnosis, that there are non-producers. So you can have an HCC and, and it's so 50. It's super high, it's just sort of diagnostic, but if it's not high, it doesn't rule it out. You don't rule it out, yeah. It's just Absolutely, so yeah, clinically. Non yeah, and I think in, for surveillance, it's recommended to continue uh, along with ultrasound. And, and when we treat uh, hep C with cirrhosis in conjunction with HIV, we're getting up to a social uh, Is there any role for A good question. So the first one about proton therapy, I don't think it's been looked at very closely. I'll have to talk to Jenny if there's any data. I haven't seen any data looking at proton. And then the second question about, you know, patients who are untreated hep C with recently diagnosed HCC, should we be treating them? So I think there's some debate. Um, I've heard from some of the hepatologists, um, I think they said there's been some thoughts that if you treat the hep C, that HCC might actually get worse. There's been some debate if that's actually true or not. Um, and then some of my patients recently I've had where they have really marginal liver function. Our thought was, let's try to treat the hep C if we think it's relatively slow growing, which it can be in HCC. Treat that first for a couple months and see if their liver function improves before we move forward with systemic therapy. So I think that's um, it's unclear right now. I think if we have patients with very advanced disease, we, we just move forward with treating the HCC. Um, so it depends on case by case. So let's talk about, um, oh, any other questions? Sorry. So my understanding is that Hep B is one of those that you actually don't have to have cirrhosis to develop uh, HCC. It, most patients do, but it, it can occur even without uh, full cirrhosis uh, development on, on tissue biopsies. 
Oh, question over here. Are you aware of any targeted therapies in the pipeline uh, or the antigens that are expressed in a more mm. Yeah, so I, I don't know of any other specific. I know, I mean, there are many clinical trials ongoing, uh, but I'm not aware of any kind of ones that target any surface antigens uh, specific to HDC. So let's talk about um, sh shifting gears into drug development. So good transition question. So when we look at the success of clinical trials as a whole, uh, unfortunately, oncology um, is it's very difficult to get drugs from phase one into approval by the FDA. Um, you can see on average it's around 10 percent, but oncology it's you know closer to 7 percent from phase one to approval. Now, natural products have been a source of uh, anti-cancer agents for many years. So this is a review article looking at agents from, since 1940. You can see about 40% of patients, uh, 40, not patients, but medications that are FDA approved are actually what we would consider naturally derived. So even coming directly from a plant or using that compound and creating a new synthetic uh, drug um, that mimics that. And then more recently, if you look at even a third of our currently approved FDA anti-cancer therapies still come from plants. So it's a, an important source of uh, development. Now, many of the chemotherapies you might have already come across, like venblastine, arena-tecan, paclitaxel, etoposide, are actually all plant-derived. Um, since I, my other hat is I do integrative oncology, I always have patients who say, well, Dr. Lee, I want a natural treatment for my cancer. And I'm, well, you're actually on paclitaxel, and it's from a U-bark tree. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. So, um, they're, they're already getting their wish. So. Um, and, you know, more recently, what's been approved that's been naturally derived? So there's been two examples. Um, arsenic trioxide, which I know you would say, well, arsenic is a poison, which is true, but for promolycytic leukemia, it, ha it is standard of care for this type of treatment. It actually came from a Chinese medicine formula in China, and they reported putting patients in remission, and then um, they realized it was this rock that they grinded into the Chinese formula, and the rock was an arsenic rock, and that had the active compound, and now it's arsenic trioxide utilized for uh, this type of leukemia. Uh, and then more recently, I think this is 2016, a trabectidin was approved for soft tissue sarcomas, and it actually came from a sea squirt. Um, and so there are groups out there still actively uh, pulling extracts from natural uh, products. But it is kind of like a needle in the haystack because, um, you know, my patients come to me and they'll say, hey, Dr. Lee, I want my natural treatment uh, for my cancer. And, of course, if you Google, you say natural cure for cancer, there's like 10 million hits, right? And the patients don't know what to do. And, unfortunately, most of the stuff that's being sold out there I would consider manure. <laughs> It's uh, not, uh, not of any real benefit. But I do think there are still some uh, needles still in the stack somewhere. Okay. So when you think about you know, drug development, translational drug development, you know, we always talk about from bench to bedside um, as really, or bench to clinical trial as the, the really classical model. Um, but also I had uh, professors when I was training who would also say, well, when they think about translational, it's really thinking about uh, from uh, bedside to bench. So, uh, in, in drug uh, natural product drug development, I think we've often gone from bedside. We have a supplement that people are even using. We go straight to a clinical trial. And if you look at supplement clinical trials, at least in cancer, it, almost uh, many of them have failed. Uh, it's a very, very high um, failure rate, much higher than, I would say, traditional uh, drug development. So when we think about translational natural product uh, drug development, um, I think we really have to start with uh, a different approach and really thinking about um, is there quality observational data that can give us an idea of what we should be researching? Because 10 million is too many, and we've got to narrow that down to maybe a dozen or so, and then take that back to the laboratory before we go to a clinical trial and really understand what we're working with. Um, so this is, uh, this is a true story that started uh, probably five, six, seven years ago when I first got to MD Anderson. Um, I had a patient with advanced HCC, and classically, they said, Dr. Lee, I've run out of uh, treatment options. Uh, I can't get on a clinical trial because of my liver dysfunction. What else do you uh, have to offer? And I said, I, I told her I honestly didn't have anything. And then she pulled out this paper, and she said, well, what do you think about mistletoe? I saw this paper on PubMed, and uh, I'm wondering if I should try it. Because I, I, they're telling me to go to hospice. And I said, well, this looks interesting. So I look at the paper, and they actually treated 120 advanced liver cancer patients. This is back in um, the early 2000s. So really, there was no treatment at that time. And they reported 20% um, of patients had a CRPR rate, which is really unheard of. Uh, and then a third of patients had stable disease. Um, and if you look at the responders, the responders did, definitely did much better. Now it's a single arm, non-placebo controlled study. Um, but it, and it's coming from Egypt. And I was like, oh, I don't know about you know, Egypt, a different biology. Is this a reputable study? 
Uh, but my colleague at MD Anderson, who actually leads the HTC program, he is actually from Egypt. So I said, you know, what do you think about this paper? He said, oh, no, I, I know this cancer center. And he said, this is a very reputable cancer center. And then later on, he actually met the authors at a, at a meeting. He said, no, they're, they're, they're legitimate. Um, I think we can believe this study. So I said, this is really interesting. So many of you are thinking mistletoe, but it's a different kind of mistletoe. It's not, not for the holidays. Uh, so in Europe, especially in Germany, they've been using mistletoe extracts as a medicinal treatment. Uh, and so there's different types of mistletoe. It's a parasitic plant. And, uh, and they make pharmaceutical grade uh, product from the mistletoe. Uh, these are just some of the different kinds, Iscador, uh, Fraxini is what we actually, we're going to talk about, Helexor, and there's a lot of different compounds within the mistletoe lectin, uh, mistletoe extract that we see. So what we decided to do uh, with Ahmed Kassab and another colleague of mine, Pei Yang, was we said, well, if this is, we think this is real, how do we figure this out? And so we came up with kind of three objectives starting to look at the mistletoe. One being do we even believe the data that exists? So um, can we document any biological effects, and can we reproduce the anti-cancer effects in the laboratory? So what Ahmed and I decided to do was for patients who had HCC, who had failed standard treatments, um, who couldn't get on a clinical trial, we said, well, let's offer them mistletoe. Um, so we actually treated about 10 patients with mistletoe uh, who met this criteria. And so what we, um, what we, and then here we're actually training alpha fetal protein. And now alpha fetal protein, you know, patients might have alpha fetal protein of 100 or can actually as high as 10,000. So I'm just looking at the relative changes in the alpha fetal protein ratio from baseline. So this is the first patient we treated. And we would give them a dose and we'd actually see the alpha fetal protein drop and then we had to stop because of the side effects and we treat them again. And then eventually he became resistant. Um, but early on we thought, well, there seems to be some biological activity here. Uh, and you can see in patient nine, the patient was on it for over eight months. And he actually stopped, um, he was stable disease, he had metastatic HCC. Uh, a new phase one clinical trial just opened up. And he said, oh, I want to try this phase one. I said, well, this is off protocol. Just go ahead and go on the phase one. If it doesn't work, come back to mistletoe. So you need a one month washout. So he stopped the mistletoe. Uh, the day before he was gonna go start the phase one, he was diagnosed with a brain med. Um, and so we, you know, and we actually, a couple of these patients some of them we weren't sure it was working or not. And what you see is that as soon as we stopped, you see a quick elevation AFP. So we actually felt that we had enough data that it had some biological effect in these patients. At least two or three of them, I think, benefited uh, from the mistletoe. So then what we said, well, let's just start buying the mistletoe. So I actually um, would order it online from these German companies, and I sent it to my house because I didn't want them to know I was working at MD Anderson. So I sent it to my house, and I gave it to my colleague, Pei Yang. And a couple months later, she said, no, I think, I think there's something there. There's some anti-cancer activity. She was actually working with Ahmed on another, another compound, and so she just threw it in there. And she said, you know, especially the Fraxini, which turned out to be the extract that was used in the phase two clinical trial. So here we start to say, okay, well, the story seems to be working. And so when we looked at different cell lines, so these are all HCC-derived cell lines, we could see that certain cell lines were more sensitive than other cell lines. And then we started to analyze what's happening to them in the cell cycle. And we actually see sub-G1, increasing, meaning that it's going into apoptosis, this is Fax analysis, using the Fraxini extract. So we could actually um, document that there were biological changes in the laboratory. And one of the things, uh, Peng's uh, tech, her lab tech said, you know, the cells look different. So she sent it for EM, and what we actually see is that the mitochondria become pycnotic, they really become condensed down. So we knew there was some kind of biological effect occurring within the cell um, that was related to the Fraxini. And then we moved on to xenograft models, uh, I know you're eating lunch, so I apologize. But essentially, the bottom line is that when you treat these mice subcutaneously with the Fraxini, you can actually have decreased tumor volume um, and weight of these uh, tumors that we injected subcutaneously. So in terms of objective one, early on we said, okay, is there a biological effect both clinically and in the laboratory? We, we felt yes. The answer was yes, and that we should continue pursuing. So then the thought was, well, what is it within the extract that might be working? So we sent it to the core facility to fractionate the uh, Fraxini. So here we just did a simple water and lipid soluble fraction. And you can see really it's the water soluble fraction that appears to have the active ingredient. And then we sent that for further fractionation. And what you're seeing here is that fraction 7, 8, 9 appear to have really the active compound. So then the question, well, what's in those fractions? So one of the compounds that's thought to have the biological activity of mistletoe is mistletoe lectins. It's been well described uh, by the Germans for many years in Europe that uh, there's the mistletoe lectins one through three, and you can find them in almost all the different types of mistletoe lectin. And what we know is that it has an A and B chain connected by a, di a disulfide bond. Um, and it appears that the A chain has what we think is the active uh, act activity, 
and it's very similar to ricin, another poison. Um, and then the B chain appears to help with the binding to the cell surface. So then uh, we actually found that sigma had a mistletoe lectin concentrate, purified mistletoe lectin 1,3. So then we started testing that. And what you can see is here the fraxini is in micrograms. And when we tested the mistletoe lectin extract, it's into nanogram. We're actually seeing a thousand-fold increased potency using the mistletoe lectin. And again, we're showing apoptosis. Uh, you can see uh, cleave PARP um, as you get to increasing doses of the um, mistletoe lectin concentrate. So, um, so we know that it's having the same biological effect as the extract. So we felt like, okay, we've kind of narrowed down the active compound. So then the question is, well, what is it really doing? And this is kind of where the work is at now. So we sent um, the cell um, uh, lysates over to the RPPA, reverse space protein array. So basically what you can tell from the RPPA is that you can see changes in proteins. So they have an array that has, I think, two to 300 proteins on it. And what stuck out to us, um, actually the paying, I actually, uh, at first when she told me, I think it's CMIC. She said, oh, CMIC is one of the biggest changes. I was like, everyone's been working on CMIC for years. Are you sure? Do you really believe the data? Um, but then she started looking into specifically, looking at CMIC protein levels. And you can see when you treat it, uh, the protein levels go down uh, as higher doses. Uh, and it induces the same kind of uh, apoptotic uh, pathways that we've seen. So we thought, well, is it really um, CMIC that's really causing this? So when we look at the different cell lines, we show that the different cell lines seem to have different sensitivities to the fraxini mesotel lectin. And then what she did is she looked at the endogenous CMIC levels in these different cell lines. So HEP3B turns out to be the most sensitive, and HEP3B turns out to have the highest levels of endogenous CMIC. And the PLC line has the lowest levels of CMIC endogenously, just naturally in the cell lines. Um, and then when she tried to knock down CMIC, it seemed to reduce the effect of the fraxini by knocking down CMIC. So uh, we really thought maybe CMIC might be one of the active mechanisms. So if you look at the literature, it turns out CMIC has been uh, reported by other groups to be really important in both the um, development of HCC um, and in terms of outcomes. So let's take a look at one of the studies. So this is a study uh, published in PLL1 uh, where they looked at CMIC amplification in HCC and overall survival. And you can see those who have amplification of CMIC do much worse, all right, in terms of as a prognostic factor. We looked at the TCGA database, publicly available, and we also looked at low versus high CMIC, and again, we're seeing a prognostic indicator of uh, increased aggressiveness of the cancer for patients who have uh, high CMIC levels. And then there was a publication by a group out at Stanford that had actually developed a CMIC model that could turn off. Uh, it was a TET a CMIC model. And when you turn on the CMIC, they quickly form liver cancers. And then if you turn it off, actually, the liver cancer will actually regress, showing that CMIC does indeed play an important role in HDC. So, um, and then we also had access to a CMIC inhibitor. And when we looked at the CMIC inhibitor profile compared to Fraxini, we thought it was very similar. So this work really kind of keeps moving us toward that maybe CMIC is part of the pathway or active mechanism of action. Now, when we look at, this is RNA level, so when we look at transcriptionally, the Fraxini does not appear to change RNA levels, transcription. Um, but then when we put in a proteasome inhibitor, so degradation of CMIC, you can see when we have the proteasome inhibitor, it seems to uh, eliminate the CMIC down, down regulation, okay? Um, and then Payne started to looking at the phosphorylation sites, and I'll talk about this more in depth, but serine 62 helps stabilize CMIC, and serine 58 marks it for degradation. And what we're seeing, at least early on, is that maybe Fraxini helps dephosphorylate a serine 62, which would then mark CMIC for degradation. So that is one of our hypotheses. And we've been also looking at CMIC's half-life. Uh, and what we notice is that when you look, uh, cyclohexamide is basically will stop translation, so you stop protein synthesis. Um, and you can see, so when you give the uh, mistletoe lectin, concentrate, it does decrease the half-life. And then when you use it together with the cyclohexamide, there's further decline. So our indication is at least there's some degree, it's not, uh, it's not a high amount of decrease in half-life, but we do see some decline in the half-life of the CMIC protein itself, so um, decreasing its overall function. So what do, we, what do we hypothesize so far what's happening? So based on the, um, you know, what's already been published and what we've been working on is that the, the mistletoe lectin, the AB, the B binds to N-galactosides on the cell surface, and that leads to endocytosis of the mistletoe lectin, and then leads to um, the disulfide bond being broken, and the mistletoe lectin A chain is then released into the cell. From there, um, 
our current working hypothesis is that uh, <coughs> CMYK is activated by ERK, um, and we talked about serine 62 as stabilizing the CMYK protein, uh, and then allows it to go into uh, the nucleus for cell proliferation. And, um, but then if you phosphorylate at T58, it then marks it for degradation. So our hypothesis is somehow mesotolectin is post-translationally affecting the CMYK protein and marking it for degradation is our current hypothesis and where we're at, although we still have a lot more work to kind of uh, determine this. So um, we recently had a grant from the GI Spore, a pilot grant, so we're trying to confirm, is CMYK really the primary uh, pathway and mechanism of action? Can we use CMYK expression as a biomarker for activity for mesotolectin treatment? Um, can we actually describe how is it, uh, where is the mesotolectin interacting? Is it binding directly to CMYK? Is it binding to PP2A? or other proteins within the cell. And then ultimately, if we actually understand how the mesotolectin is interacting with maybe CMYK or other proteins, can we either alter that structure or even make small molecules from that understanding to develop new drugs? Um, I will say also we've looked at mesotolectin and other CMYK-driven cancers. So the classic, of course, is Burkitt's lymphoma, and we actually do see it has anti-cancer activity in Burkitt's lymphoma. So, the thought that it's CMYK related is continues in other cell types. So, um, but we're we're not. Uh, I don't think we have enough data to say that's you know for sure the case. So, um, just taking this as an example of you know natural product drug discovery is really taking that data uh, from the bedside from patients, going to the laboratory, and hopefully we can eventually get back to a clinical trial. Uh, and then if we understand it well enough, can we make a new drug out of this that'll be highly effective in CMYK driven cancers? Uh, is our, so this is actually one of many um, natural products that I have on my list of things that actually uh, I've either learned from patients or there's actually clinical data that exists. The other one I think is pretty exciting is mushroom extract. So I actually have a couple um, studies ongoing right now working with Alex Wong and uh, John Pink where we're looking at both cell lines and animal models of two um, mushroom extracts from Japan that actually have clinical data. They've actually already studied this in Japan. The PSK actually has been studied in prospective randomized trials showing benefit but we really don't understand how they work. So we're working on that as well, and a couple other, Paulo Azul is another tree bark, and SDFT is a four herbal formula that we've actually tested in the laboratory a little bit when I was down at Anderson showing some activity in lymphoma. Uh, but we haven't spent enough time under, understanding and breaking it down. So a lot of, uh, this is a huge collaboration. Um, I don't have my own lab, so I work very closely with my um, PhD collaborators, so Gotham Narla and Pei Yang, all that uh, preclinical work, and then Eric Yen, uh, who uh, works uh, with myself and, and Gotham to generate a lot of the data that you saw here today. So I have to acknowledge them. Also, Ahmed Kassab, who was a key collaborator, Dan and Anderson, and funding sources both from University Hospitals and Case Western and the GI Spore more recently. I um, also want to acknowledge we have a big liver team. I think the key thing is that you know, liver cancer really requires a multidisciplinary team. Uh, so I want to uh, acknowledge um, medical oncology, my colleague surgery, Ken's in the back there, uh, leading the transplant program, um, and also uh, thank him and uh, John and Tony for reviewing my slides, radiation oncology, uh, interventional radiation, hepatology, pathology, and radiology. So really takes a, a big team to be able to get uh, patients optimal care. So I think that's my last slide, and I'll, I'll stop there for any questions. Thanks, Chris, fantastic review and your exciting work. That was really awesome. Questions? Yeah, so it's really interesting. It does have real toxicity. So the most common toxicities you see, um, it's given subcutaneously uh, once a week. Uh, and what you'll see is both an allergic injection site reaction, so they kind of get a bee sting, but I've seen patients get a whole body rash. Uh, and then the other uh, main side effect is that patients will get fever-like symptoms. So they get fever, fatigue. What's really interesting about mistletoe, as opposed to traditional chemotherapy, is that the side effects tend to go away. So the guy who was on it for eight months, almost after about two months of being on mistletoe, the fever and the injection site reaction just seemed to dissipate. And so he he'd just go to work. He was like, I think he ran a car dealership or you know fixed cars. And so he'd just go to work and take the mistletoe once a week. Well, it's interesting, if you look at it online, patients will come to me and say, well, mistletoe is supposed to be reduce the side effects from chemotherapy. I'm like, I, I don't know about that. So uh, I've had to hospitalize one or two patients because they had a really strong reaction. So I tend to start at a low dose and then ramp it up. 
Yeah, so uh, we are studying, the, one of our aims in the GI spore is to start, think about therapeutic rational combinations with other drugs. So um, I think you're exactly right. We want to start looking at that as another uh, avenue to help potentiate the effect. There was also, I think, uh, I don't know if it was in Nature or Science, but someone published, I think the same group out of Stanford, indicated that CMYK is an important regulator of, like, um, immunologic markers, including PD, PD-1. So there might be an opportunity to combine therapies as well with immunotherapy. Great. There are no questions. I want to thank you for a really fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Happy to do it.